to start this sermon today like you might remember Rod Serling starting the Twilight Zone. I know some of you heard of Rod Serling. Some of you have probably seen the Twilight Zone. Picture, if you will, picture yourself to be 14 or 15 years old. You and three or four of your close friends. You've had a very blessed life. You live in an upper echelon part of town. You've got plenty to eat, you've got nice clothes, you come from an aristocratic family. When all of a sudden, out of nowhere, an enemy comes and conquers the land that you live. This enemy does not give you any time to pack any belongings, say goodbye to family, but immediately grabs you and marches you away from where you live, you and your friends, 500 miles. That's not in a bus, not on a train, you're walking probably have the clothes on your back. You're walking 500 miles. You're a teenager. And when you get to this land that's 500 miles away, it's a pagan society. It's foreign to you. It's a completely different language. It's a completely different culture. They worship different gods than the one god that you worship. Multiple gods, an entire pantheon of gods. They change your name. They change your friends' names, teach you their language, spend about three years teaching you how to serve their king, and now you get to serve their king with a smile on your face for the next 70 years of your life. Doesn't sound too much fun, does it? That was Daniel. If you turn in your Bibles to Daniel, we're going to be in chapter 1 today. We're going to cover all 21 verses in chapter 1. That little illustration paints a picture of what happened to Daniel. Daniel showed an extreme level of grace under immense pressure during the time of the Babylonian conquest of the southern kingdom of Judah. Daniel also reveals what he did with God's grace, not compromising on the principles of of being a godly man. Now Daniel's divided into two, it's divided into 12 chapters, but it's divided into two particular portions. Daniel chapters 1 through 6 deal with Daniel's life and his three friends and some other players that are key to the story. Daniel 7 through 12 deal with Daniel's visions and Daniel's prophetic writings. Our focus that we're beginning today, as we discuss the life of Daniel, will begin with chapter 1 and end in chapter 6. Today we will cover chapter 1. This will cover Daniel's life, Daniel's experiences, and what chapter 1 will do is it will deal with Daniel's identity, Daniel's character, and an introduction of him into the Babylonian world. So if you enjoy me in the first chapter of Daniel, starting in verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Those last names are the ones that we 
think of when we think of that fiery furnace story, we think of those names. And you never stop and think, or I never did, you never stop and think, that wasn't their names. That was the names that the Babylonian Empire gave those three guys. And very seldom do you hear Daniel referred to his Babylonian name of Belteshazzar. Well, that's because Daniel had the privilege of writing his own book. And let's think about this for a minute. And if I take you off into exile to another country and change your name and you're writing a book, are you going to use the name I give you or are you going to use the name God gave you? You use the name God gave you, right? This section of Scripture, verses 1 through 7, deals with Daniel and his friends, their identity, and their character. The historical setting is illustrated in the first two verses of this chapter, and we're able to actually tie a literal physical timeline to when this happened. This would have been in the 605 to 604 BC era. And the way we know this is, is because Daniel is very specific in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. This can be doc documented historically with other documents that are not in the canon of Scripture, that are in the annals of history, and are also contained within other kingdoms' documentations, beautiful and hieroglyphics. The dating in verse 1 would refer to the date that Daniel and his friends and the nobility and aristocracy were exiled from the southern kingdom of Judah. See, when Nebuchadnezzar decided he was going to conquer the southern kingdom, he did it in three phases. And in the 605 to 604 BC area, he took Daniel and his three friends and some of the upper echelon of society. Approximately eight years later, oh, 597 BC more or less, Nebuchadnezzar exiled a larger group. This group was believed to contain the prophet Ezekiel. And then 10 years later, in 587, 587, 586, according to some scholars, uh, is when Nebuchadnezzar finally sacked the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Interesting point I want to share with you in verse 2. Verse 2, Daniel says, And the Lord delivered the king of Judah into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. In researching the writing in the language that Daniel wrote, this in Daniel's phraseology for this statement is more accurately read, it might be in some of your Bibles, I'm using the NIV, as from the temple of the God. And that was Daniel's unique way, it would appear from an authorial standpoint, to state not just one in the many of the Babylonians but the God, the one true God, the one and only God. Now verses 3 through 7, we find an introduction to Daniel and an introduction to his friends and a little bit of a description about their social status. I didn't just make up that they were of nobility or royal status. The scriptures tell us that. They were young. They had no physical defects. They were handsome. I'm going to leave it to you to define what handsome means. Using the eye of the beholder, the scripture says they were they were good looking folks, they were young, smart, teachable. The king would not want anyone with any physical defects or a dim witted person working in his court. Now their names, in verse 6 7, we see their names, their real names, and then the names the Babylonians gave them. Daniel was named Belteshazzar. Now Daniel means God is my judge. Belteshazzar means Bel protect his life. And this is derived from Bel Marduk, which is one of the names of the many of the Babylonian gods. The chief god of Babylon, actually. Hananiah, who was given the name Shadrach, well, Hananiah means the Lord shows grace. Shadrach means under command of a coup. Who was the moon god of Babylon? How do you worship all those gods? I just can't imagine that too much from my mind. Azariah, who was also called in Babylonian Abednego. Azariah means the Lord helps. Abednego is servant of Nego, or Nebo. And that was the Babylonian god of learning and writing. Mishael, also known as Meshach in Babylonian, 
Mishael means who is like God. His name was changed to who is like Aku, who is like the moon god of Babylon. Now, these new names were more important reason to the eyes of Babylonian. Because when you conquer a people, the first thing you want to do is eliminate their identity. So the quickest way to eliminate a person's identity is to take away their name and give them a new name in the thought that perhaps this will help them assimilate into the new Babylonian kingdom to which they have been exiled and to which they will serve not only to Babylon, but to Babylon's gods. Now, you'll notice in the letter as we continue forward, not only this week, but later on in our study of Daniel, that Daniel never refers to himself as Belteshazzar because Daniel's writing this book and Daniel decided that he is going to call himself Daniel. Now, I repeat that mainly because you'll see him refer to from time to time Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Well, Daniel is writing this in a Babylonian environment and does acknowledge that the standard and common name for his three friends would be their Babylonian name. And that's why when we're telling stories or we hear the stories as kids of Daniel and the lion's den, but then we hear of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace and not their Hebrew names, is because Daniel had referred to them under their common name in the area in which Daniel lived and the geographic location in which he lived. See, Daniel spent the rest of his life in that life. And he did not write these scriptures until later on in his life. Picking up in verse 8, we find ourselves that they've been, that they've been assigned in Babylon new names, new identities. So obviously the goal is for them to become Babylonian, no longer Hebrew, no longer from Judah, Israelites. Verse 8 picks up, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord the King who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and as a writer, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the garden took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. Interesting point that you'll pick up from what Daniel's telling us here is Daniel was in a culture that did not honor God. Daniel was being provided with a meal standard that did not honor God's law that was given to his people. But Daniel still endeavored with every ounce of his fortitude to obey God's laws, to remain resolute. And to resolve, as Daniel's words are, resolve not to defile. That's a strong word. It's a very strong word. And it's referring to being devoted to principle and to being committed to this particular course of action. Not to give in to the pressures that were around him. This happens to us sometimes where we find ourselves being pressured by the temporal realm and by our surroundings. And it gives us an illustration as to how Daniel handled a similar situation those situations that you and I handle in the world today. That we have to understand that like Daniel, we should endeavor to obey God regarding, regardless of whatever the external pressures are for us to not do so. So you see a moral test here for Daniel and his three friends. His decision in verse 8, he's resolute. He wants to obey God even though he's surrounded by pagans. You have to understand, too, that the, the meat that they were going to be able to eat would not necessarily have been bad meat. It could have been pork because they were pagans and pork was not an unclean animal to them, being Gentiles. It could have been beef, which would have been an acceptable meal. But this meat could have been blessed or used as an offering or as a 
were sacrificed to a pagan god and which would have made it unclean. And that was a risk that Daniel did not want to take because he took his obedience to God very seriously and did not want to compromise. So we find Aspenaz's response being, you can tell he likes Daniel. He wants to give Daniel what Daniel wants, but he likes his head even more. And he doesn't want his head to end up on a platter in front of King Nebuchadnezzar. So he has a little concern about it. So Daniel has a proposal. Daniel compromises. Daniel shows a lucrative side here. Give us 10 days. Vegetable and water only for 10 days. If you don't like the way we look in 10 days, we eat the king's food. We drink the king's water. Give us a point. Give us a chance. So Ashpenaz agrees. And the outcome in verses 15 and 16 show us that they not only looked as good as the other young folks who were being educated in the ways of the king of Babylon, but they looked even better. So Daniel did not compromise, and since he did not compromise and put his faith in God, God showed his grace to Daniel and caused Ashpenaz to allow him to not defile himself with the other thing food. Picking up in verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. So we see in verses 17 through 21 that we just read, we see God's blessings upon Daniel and his three friends for remaining resolute and remaining obedient. We see in verse 17 that God granted them with a gift. The scripture doesn't say that the Babylonians taught Daniel and his three friends all of this wisdom and all of this literature. No, verse 17 says to these four men, God gave the knowledge. So this was a gift from God. God gave them knowledge. Daniel even possessed the ability to understand dreams and visions. So they were very best by, blessed by God for their obedience. They were finding favor before the Babylonian court. The king says that he found none equal to the four. We don't know how many were there, but there were several that were in training, obviously. And there were none equal to these four. They were ten times better than... Ten times better than all the rest. Sorry, I'm not making the challenge times. Ten times better than all the rest. Is this a literal statement? Is this a figurative statement? Is this word for word? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that they gave a test to Daniel and his three friends scored ten times better on the test. I think this is an illustration of part of Daniel. To describe the fact that he and his friends were so blessed by God that they were head and shoulders above the rest in their understanding of wisdom, their understanding of literature, and Daniel's ability to interpret and, and, and foretell based on dreams. So I, I believe we're looking at a figurative sense here. We don't necessarily know. It's not exactly important to the big picture of the story of chapter 1. But in verse 21, we see God granted Daniel with a long life. Now, we can do the math on Daniel's age. We know that Daniel was taken captive and sent to Babylon 605-604 B.C. In, in the Babylonian, um, Babylonian community, young men were considered to be young adults ready to be trained at the age of 14 or 15 years old. So we can surmise that Daniel's birthday is on or around 620 B.C. Okay? And he was 14, 15, and 604, 605 when he went to Babylon. So we can calculate Daniel's age as to at 
least how long he lived to be, because we don't know when he died. But chapter 10, verse 1 of this very same book refers to the third year of Cyrus. And that's Cyrus, king of Persia. We can document Cyrus taking over Babylon in the year 539-538 B.C. So if you want to see a, a contrast of when Daniel was born and when we know he was at least alive still, we can calculate that to 535 B.C., which would have made Daniel... 85 years old at least. So we know he lived to be at least 85. So God granted Daniel a very long life. He got to live an aristocratic lifestyle for the most part. He had a few hiccups along the way. We'll get to those in other chapters. Uh, he certainly was tested. His faith was tested. His endurance was tested. But God's grace prevailed because Daniel never stopped his reliance upon God. But Daniel was granted the thing that every young person wants, and that's a long life. Most of you are a couple years older than me. Three, maybe five, okay. But you know, when you were young, I'd say nobody in this room, myself included, and even the young fellow in the back, when you're young, you never said, man, when I grow up, I'm going to die young. <laughs> nobody ever said. We all want to live a long life, as healthy as we possibly can. And if not, then when we get older, we're thankful and blessed that God's given us a long life. Well, God gave Daniel a long life. Daniel was very blessed. Let me encapsulate this for a minute. What does this mean for us today? You live a life without compromise when you stay true to your convictions. Okay? Daniel 8 says, but Daniel chose not to defile himself. Daniel was not going to adhere to the local pagan customs. So put your convictions to a self-test, okay? And I'll do the same for myself. Let's go into the test of secrecy for a minute, okay? Would you be embarrassed if others knew everything you said or did? Everything. Everything you said or did. Would you welcome Jesus to sit by your side and view all of your activities? Don't get anything answer this out loud. I'm not going to answer this out loud. There's the test of universality that we need to consider too. Would you encourage everyone to do what you do? What kind of community and world would we have if everyone were involved in the things you do that other people don't know about? Then there's the test of prayer. Can you pray and ask God's blessings on all of your activities? All. John 14, 6 tells us where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Truth being a divine attribute, the way being Christ, we should, as new creations in Christ, let Christ dwell within us and that light, light shine within us. So the light shines not just from within. Let's cover from within for just a second. Do you ever feel guilty or uneasy about an activity that you're involved in? Do you usually trust your conscience to be a signal when you feel guilty about something, perhaps? Although you can't always trust your mind. As someone once said, Neurotics build castles in the sky, psychotics live in them, and the psychiatrists collect the rent. Now, I can't speak for everybody, but I can like, tell them myself for just a minute. I've had thoughts in my life. It doesn't matter what those thoughts are. But I've had thoughts, and no sooner did I have that thought than I asked myself, why in the world did I have that thought? That was not right. That's because we're human. We're broken. We're flawed. We're imperfect. Don't give the devil a foothold. When you have a thought like that, say, I don't want to think that way anymore. And pray to God. And let God just completely invade your mind. Give Him your thoughts. Give Him your heart. Give Him your mind. You also have not just the light from within, but you have the light without. The light from without. Because you can get excellent counsel from godly Christians. Proverbs 11.14 tells us this, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. 
I'll learn from you. Maybe you learn from me. Maybe you learn from the person that sits next to you or you share godly wisdom with the person that sits next to you. I've received godly wisdom from my 23-year-old son that comes in my life. Where I went, wow, surely he couldn't have come up with that. And even later he told me, I don't know where I came up with that. Knew it. Yes, I know. That was inspired by God. So we can get godly counsel from each other. No matter how old, no matter how young, no matter how well or poorly educated, God will be surprised. will send the person you least expect into your life to convey a message. Just like He sent a stutterer to the Israelites to free them from bondage in Egypt. And He sent a murderer and an adulteress to be kingdom over united Israel and to be a man after his own heart. So don't be surprised when God sends the person you least expect into your life to provide you light from without. If that's light you can encapsulate and bring within. There's also a light from above, that inexhaustible source above that can be yielded to us through prayer. The best source of light is from above. James 1.5 tells us, if anyone lacks wisdom, let the person ask of God. Because God has all the wisdom. Pray, and then pray, and then pray soon for the wisdom that you seek. The Scripture says that God will give you the wisdom that you need. Now you can live your life without compromise when you stand the test of opposition and temptation. As Daniel showed us in chapters, in, in verses 12 through 16, there's a portion where he says, test your servants for 10 days. He's standing the test of opposition. He's standing the test of temptation. He's compromised only Ashpenaz. He has not compromised himself. He has compromised Nebuchadnezzar's guard. Give us 10 days. And God rewarded him for that. Because let's face it, if you're, if you're eating nothing but vegetables and drinking water with a bunch of younger folks who are sitting around eating the choicest beef and protein and drinking wine, the odds are the more robust individuals are going to be the ones that are getting the higher level of protein and the more well-rounded diet. Vegetables and water alone would not necessarily be as healthy as having a protein level in the diet. But no, they were not just equal to the others who were eating the king's food in their health. They were more healthier and looked more visibly strong to Ashkenaz. Daniel's character, his life choices, his actions reflect that he stood firmly obedient to God in times of great trial and great testing. Working for a godless king in a pagan country, Daniel did not falter. He dedicated and devoted his entire life to God. Every single aspect of his life, Daniel remained devoted to God. And God rewarded Daniel for this commitment in many different ways and in many different times throughout his life. We've only covered one today, and we have many more to come in the weeks to come. God desires for you to give your life to Him. And when I say that, I mean He wants you to give your life. And if you can step out of your life and put it right here, He doesn't want you to just take parts of it. He wants that life to be within you. And then He wants to be within you too. God wants every single aspect of every waking and every sleeping moment of your life and my life. God wants to be a part of that. God doesn't want to be just a part of the good times, just a part of the bad times, just a part of the right before meal time, just a part of the right before I go to sleep time. Pray without ceasing. God wants to be a part of every single solitary aspect of your life. God wants you to give your life to me, my life to Him, completely with no compromises. Daniel did not compromise, and he was rewarded. If you and I do not compromise, we will also be rewarded by our Father in Heaven. God will take you and your life, me and my life. He will lead us in everything we do, in every aspect. We'll just let Him. We'll just give Him the chance. 
we have to commit to Him. And today, my challenge for me, and hopefully your challenge for you, is to take this moment right now, and as we go to God in prayer, recommit your life to Christ. Rededicate your life to Christ. Can you bow your heads with me?